everybody, I'm Aaron Simmons, and this is the bonus video for my August 2023 newsletter. If you are subscribed to the newsletter and watching this video in August, thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support and being part of this community that we're forming together to think about philosophy in practical ways. If you are watching this video later, September, October, whatever, that means that you didn't get to it until it became public, which I do a month after releasing it exclusively to my newsletter subscribers. So go on over to jrnsimmons.com and get subscribed now so that you get all of these longer form videos when they get released a month before I make them public to anybody else. All right. Whether you're watching this video right when it comes out or in coming months, please be sure to drop in some comments. Think with me about these ideas. I love hearing from you and talking with you. I really do appreciate all of your engagement and hopefully the ideas that I am sharing with you are things that encourage you in your daily lives. All right, so the theme for this month's newsletter is improvisation. And thinking about improvisation, creativity, innovation as a kind of existential task. So I decided that for the bonus video, what I wanted to do is actually invite you into a little bit of my own improvisational structures as it concerns my teaching intro to philosophy. I teach introduction to philosophy almost every semester here at Furman University, and I'm actually teaching a section of it right now from this very spot. So this is my little makeshift uh, podcast studio, YouTube studio, and it's also where I teach any of my online courses over Zoom. And so this summer course is an online version, and so I teach from this very spot to all of these students twice a week. So it's, it's important to remember that when we approach teaching philosophy, there are so many different ways to think about how to do this. We can do it as a history of philosophy, kind of hitting the high points of the great thinkers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, moving forward, hitting Aquinas and Descartes and Kant and on. And as we do that, that's important. And it's a way of teaching philosophy I have done and I love doing because it introduces current generations to a conversation that precedes them, but one that they should participate in. It helps them find their voice, and I think that's valuable. But more and more, I was realizing that lots of my introduction to philosophy courses were not being taken by students interested in perhaps majoring in philosophy, but they were juniors and seniors who either needed this particular course to graduate or who were excited to take a course just as an elective and they had heard good things about philosophy. As I got more of that latter kind of student, I started thinking about the importance of philosophy not just being something for a particular major in college and that you know, then sets you up well to go to grad school, but it's actually a more robust way of thinking about who we are and why it matters that we be invested in things like goodness, beauty, and truth. So philosophy for life became really the impetus to the way I've approached philosophy as an introductory course over the past three, four years. Now, COVID actually maximized this particular approach because my students were struggling so much with so much that it allowed them to have a kind of respite where we could think together. And these ideas were things that were immediately practicable in their lives. They were immediately able to gain traction. So rather than it being important someday, I think philosophy is something that is important all days. And so by thinking about philosophy in this applied way as a way of life, not just a academic discipline, I think that this invites students to reflect on the big questions and learn some of the important names in the history of philosophy, but in such a way that they don't assume that studying philosophy is somehow impractical or useless or you know, on the side of what they really do. And unfortunately, far too many parents uh, continue to encourage their students to avoid things like philosophy and instead emphasize disciplines that they perceive as more relevant to the real world. Well, 
If you've watched many of my YouTube channels, you know I'm not a big fan of the phrase, the real world. I tend to think that philosophy invites us to experience things so that we can decide what world should be made real. And that constructive aspect is, I think, a philosophical version of improvisation as a way of life. So I want to invite you into my Intro to Philosophy course that I'm currently teaching. Again, it's one of many different versions that I have taught over the years, but I think it's one that I, I find very compelling right now. It focuses on the theme of how to be invested in philosophy in order that we be committed to social flourishing in democratic societies. We live in a society currently, at least those of us in the United States, that is increasingly plagued by misinformation, group polarization, conspiracy theory. It's, it's becoming very difficult to navigate the political discourse and the public discourse in ways that are life-giving, in ways that make us want to be even more involved, right? It's easy to check out. It's easy to become cynical and skeptical of any real transformation being possible. And I think that's unfortunate. And so in order to invite my students maybe to overcome that cynicism, I teach this class in this particular way, focusing on this theme of individuality in the context of community, the, the importance of deliberative virtues as constitutive of our social lives, and philosophy as fundamentally about being able to take seriously what others take for granted. When we get comfortable with question marks, I think we also get comfortable with those people who put question marks behind our claims. People with whom we disagree now don't have to be dismissed, but they can be engaged because we recognize that they're helping us think even more effectively about our views. We may not eventually get changed to their view. We may not adopt what they claim. We might continue to think that what they believe is not only wrong, but dangerous. But if we are philosophical, if we are committed to the task of social life as a philosophical virtue, then I think that we are more likely to guard against these threats to democracy and create a real democracy that is fully invested in democracy as an ideal worth pursuing. Now here, I'm getting this idea of democracy as an ideal from Robert Talese and Scott Aiken, who suggest that democracy as an ideal is more or less the idea that we are self-governing individuals in community. What's at stake in that belief? Why is that valuable? Why is that worthwhile? Those are the kinds of questions that I want to bring my students into and invite them to maybe develop some skill sets in order to navigate really effectively. So what I thought I'd do is basically walk you through the big ideas of the books that I'm currently teaching, and so we'll do Philosophy 101 in 20 minutes. And if you want to dig deeper, of course, all these books are highly recommended. Go pick them up for yourself. If you have questions about specific claims, again, drop a comment. Let's think together. First, I always start every Intro to Philosophy class that I teach, and in fact, usually every philosophy class that I teach, with a book that's simply called This is Water by David Foster Wallace. Now, this book is amazing because it's a commencement address that he gave to Kenyon College in Ohio, a liberal arts school, and he basically invites the students there, the graduates, to understand that college real education is about not just being taught how to think, but learning that we have some agency over what's worth thinking about. This, again, flips the script from simply learn how to do this, here's the algorithm, now go deploy it, and it instead invites us into a world where creativity, improvisation, possibility are in fact the, the realm in which we find ourselves, right? They become the ways in which we do what we do. Wallace suggests that when we engage what we consider obvious, we shut down questions. So what we've got to do is interrogate what we take for granted, interrogate what we consider obvious in order to open ourselves up onto the unbelievable mysteries that might confront us if we just had the eyes to look and ears to hear. 
So as one example, he talks about, you know, being on the road behind someone driving an enormous SUV, gas guzzler. They're in the fast lane going really slow. And he says, our normal inclination, our natural response is to be angry, to assume that they are in our way. But he says, it's possible, maybe not likely, but possible that that person has experienced some sort of trauma. Maybe they were in a really bad wreck, that they have to drive this vehicle in order to feel safe enough even to get back on the road. They're doing everything they can to be able to navigate these streets that we are just assuming are easily uh, operated, right? This becomes something that for them is a real challenge. So us honking at them, yelling at them, now creates even more trauma, even more difficulty for them. Now, is this probable? No, it's probably the case <laughs> that they are in that lane, ignorant of the fact that anybody else is in the world, absolutely self-absorbed with their own business. But the fact that we could see it differently opens us onto a world where we do not have to be defined by all of what everyone else hands us as normal and as obvious. This allows us to rethink things. It allows us to see it differently. And I suggest to my students that when we do that, we remind ourselves that this is water, right? And this comes from the example he gives of two fish swimming along. An old fish comes up to the two fish and says, hey, boys, how's the water? And the two fish look at each other and say, what the hell is water, right? When we become cognizant of where we are and the beauty that might be there, it allows us to be able to see philosophy not as an academic discipline, but as an invitation to living more fully, more intentionally, flourishing as individuals because we are fully invested in this community of other people who are also navigating the world with us. So we start with this is water. It invites them to see philosophy again as a way of life, as a practice of interrogating what we take for granted, as putting question marks where everybody puts periods. And then I suggest that, well, what's the goal, right? If this is what philosophy is, what is it trying to get us to do? What is the aim? And I have them read a little book by my friend Nick Riggle that is simply called On Being Awesome. <laughs> and what he suggests in this book is what it looks like to be awesome is to cultivate our individuality in creative ways such that we open spaces for others to cultivate their own individuality in response. Now, this might sound very individualistic, but what he says in the book is this is actually the right model of community. When all of us are able to be ourselves on purpose and thrive as ourselves, but in such a way that it doesn't come at the cost of other people's thriving. He describes this as a culture of awesomeness where we avoid what he terms as sucky people. We try to not suck in the world and not simply make it all about us, as Wallace also warns. Or similarly, not just you know sucking the energy and the air out of the social spaces where we find ourselves. Instead, how do we breathe life into those spaces? How do we navigate the world fully cognizant of who we are and why we are that way, but doing this in a way that invites other people to be able to relax into themselves, to, again, it, you know, explore and create insofar as selfhood is a matter of becoming, not simply a matter of resting on our laurels. It's not about who we you know, were. It's about what it is that we're putting in front of ourselves. Where are we headed? So, Remind ourselves that this is water, interrogate what everybody takes for granted in order to live into a culture defined by awesomeness. But what then do we need to do in order to facilitate that kind of awesome living? This is where we turn to Rob Talese and Scott Aiken's book, Why We Argue and How We Should. And this is an amazing book because it invites us to realize we care about argument because we believe stuff, right? To believe that something is to believe that that is true, to believe that it's true, is to believe that the best reasons support it. Now, why is this really important? Because too often we tend to act like reason giving is a distraction from our lives. We don't have time for that. 
And what Aiken and Talese suggest is unless we have time to take seriously the reasons for what we believe and then to welcome and be hospitable to the objections to our views, right? We seek out criticism so that we can do our best, do due diligence to make sure that the beliefs we hold and the actions that we take in light of those beliefs are true so far as possible. If we don't do that, then we don't have time, they suggest, for the social requirements of deliberative democratic existence. So what they do is lay out why do we argue? Because reason giving is crucial for who we are and our social spaces. And then they suggest how we should argue. And they contend that there are a whole bunch of ways that right now we are really bad at arguing. <laughs> right? We straw man other people. We tend to consider the weakest versions of views rather than the strongest versions. We tend to shout down objections. We tend to ignore people and group with only those who say yes to what we already hold to be the case. All of this is dangerous and it fosters a society that is decidedly not awesome. So, this is water. Interrogate the obvious. Live into a culture of awesomeness whereby individuality is something that actually invites genuine community. And we do this because we love reason giving. We care about evidence and we care about thinking well. Now, what are the obstacles to this sort of work? Now, I suggest two to my students. One is by Harry Frankfurt, his little book called On Bullshit. And in this book, what he does is suggests that bullshit is so rampant and it's the case where people are more interested in bringing about a particular uh, impact on an audience, a particular result on an audience, getting them to do what we desire. They're more concerned about that than they are about truth. He differentiates the bullshitter from the liar and says that for the liar, the importance is we have to think we know the truth in order to manipulate and deceive people away from it. The bullshitter doesn't even care about truth. He says that bullshit is especially common when we live in a society where people are asked to have opinions about things that they do not really understand. And think about how common that is, right? This, I think, is something that really accords well with the loss of social trust that we are all experiencing in different ways and the erasure of the important social phenomenon of expertise. It matters that we trust the right people. It matters that we are able to respect the right authorities relative to those epistemic areas, those knowledge areas that might outstrip our own understanding. So we've got to be careful about the bullshit, but also we've got to be careful about assholes, says my friend Aaron James. And in assholes, what Aaron James does is argues that assholes are people who systematically think that they are able to be entitled to special circumstances in a way that actually immunizes them from critique. Notice that would be exactly a sucky person because it's refusing reason giving and it's refusing hospitality to objection. So assholes and bullshit become these big social phenomena that we've got to guard against in order to cultivate a good epistemically healthy life so that the culture of awesomeness is possible. And we do this by being invested in realizing that where we are is always something that is more than we assume. Then we conclude the course by realizing, well, look, all of this is assuming some basic commitments to something like a democratic society. And so we should ask why democracy matters with Cornell West in his book, Democracy Matters. According to West, the importance of democracy is that democracy is in fact the best social structure that we know of for facilitating the kind of philosophical approach to existence recommended across this course. In other words, democracy is the space where because it is this ideal of self-governing individuals and community, it is then the space where we can love truth, we can care about each other, and we can strive towards justice in the context of genuine humility. He quotes Martin Luther King and talks about the importance of justice being what love looks like in public. And that idea 
is actually something that requires us to care about the public manifestation of giving and taking reasons, of realizing that the people with whom we share society also have equal access to the epistemic space where we live. So democracy matters for West because imperialism, authoritarianism, these are ideas that actively cut against the importance of real freedom, real thinking, real education, and real philosophy. So that's my course. It, it starts again by thinking about philosophy in a particular way. It's a way of life. And it moves through what's required to do this well in society, the challenges that we face, and then why it matters that we take this up as a task. My students seem to really appreciate it. They seem to engage it and receive these ideas as invitations for navigating the world where they are philosophically. I hope that it does the same for you. I hope that thinking about this idea of kind of seeing this general arc is something that allows you to realize that genuine improvisation as an existential task is not something that's just about learn these things, act according to this script, pursue this algorithm. It's a matter of freeing ourselves up in order to ask good questions and then be in good conversations with people often with whom we disagree in order that we live toward a shared future where our individuality is all able to come together to create the more compelling composition, the more compelling community. All right, so there's my philosophy intro class in 20 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed it. Again, it's not the only way to do it. It's not the only way I do it. But it is, I think, a particularly effective way given the challenges we face right now. I'll see you next time unless a piano falls on our heads.